Shivas Bhav, welcome. welcome you all. In today's environment, coding knowledge ultimately erodes your power. At IBS Hyderabad, prominence is given not only on making you academically brilliant, but true leaders and team players. Thus preparing you for real life corporate world. These guest lectures serve as an ideal platform for the students to supplement their theoretical knowledge with first hand perspectives from some of the stalwarts of the industry and also appreciate the different dimensions of handling modern day business challenges. For which we have with us today Mr. Krishna Pandyala, an author, a speaker, and a life coach with us today. It is indeed a pleasure for us to have you here tonight, sir. We welcome you. On this occasion, we even have with us Mrs. Shoha Rani Nanduri, President of IFPI Society. We welcome you too, ma'am. What inspires Mr. Krishna Pandyala? To devote his attention to helping people make better choices is his belief that every person has the potential to thrive in all the aspects of their lives. He is the director of the Mindful Nation Foundation, whose vision is to help for Americans overcome stress and lead more fulfilling lives. During his tenure as the COO and life coach at Walton Wealth Management, the firm grew a dramatic 500% through the Great Recession while improving the quality of both employees and the clients. For over 20 years, he has impacted individuals and teams at Boeing, Carnegie Mellon, the Pittsburgh Sellers, and the UNESCO using a simple yet practical framework distilled from his varied career experiences. His transformational approach has been featured in TEDx and the New York Times, the Pittsburgh Post Gazette and Incorporated Magazine. Additionally, he has been an accomplished software entrepreneur, award-winning multimedia producer, inventor and sort of a business growth and personal advisor. He is also the author of a critically acclaimed book, Beyond the Faith and the Ape, realizing success and true happiness. He is also the founder and chief empowerment officer of Tetra Advisor, a talent management firm and indicates growth and team dynamics. He received his bachelor's in civil engineering from the Indian Institute of Technology and his master's in education foundation and media technology from Indiana State University and his attempted executive programs at both Carnegie Mellon and Howard University. He lives in Pittsburgh with his wife and two kids and enjoys playing golf and kayaking. We now invite Mr. Krishna Pandyala for sharing his knowledge and experience with us. I don't have a clue what I'm going to tell you, but it's going to be fun. <laughs> and 
I had the good fortune of meeting a whole bunch of you before getting on the stage to make whatever I speak relevant to you. Because what I want to tell you may not be interesting to you. Because I'm not your age, my experiences have been different. I asked a couple of people the new metal street and they said, cool, so that takes care of that. <laughs> so I can't tell you anything about metal street. So let's go forward. Do I have a clicker? Okay, that's okay. That's good. So you guys here are smart, right? Otherwise you won't be here. Because of being smart, you end up with one problem though. You can time travel. There you go. So he or she is time traveling now to that cell phone call coming from somewhere. These things happen so automatically for me these days. The audience participates in a great way in anything I do. So time traveling happens with smart people more often than not so smart people. Which means you are either living in the future. How many of you are living in the future worried about where you're going to get a job? What are you going to do? Raise your hand. Be fair. All right. How many of you are in the past saying I should have done something different? Okay. So who is right here in this room right now? Because if nobody's here, I might as well go. <laughs> okay, so there are about eight people in this room. The rest of you can leave. <laughs> okay, so that's the thing that I talk about is so most people, how do you drive a car? So we're going to be able to talk, okay? This is not my speech, this is our show. So how do people drive a car? Move. <laughs> <laughs> move through the windshield, right? What happens if you look in the rear? How do you live life? Look in the rear. So if you drive like you live life, what do you think will happen? <laughs> Accident. Accident. Is that a good one or a bad one? <laughs> okay. How do you think your life is going to show up if you keep looking in the rear view? You're going to have an accident. So today, I want you to take a journey with me. It's a journey that I want you to participate in. I'm not going to tell you what to do. You're going to figure out what to do based on some of the experiences you will have during the next four hours. <laughs> One hour. <laughs> so, I'm going to ask you a question. And I'm going to give a copy of my book as a gift to the person who gets this answer right. Okay? How do you think an insect feels when it hits the windshield of a car? No feelings. You must not be having it. Pardon? You must not be having it. Because it doesn't have a mind, but that's a technically correct answer. <laughs> this is a joke, dude. So, <laughs> so, how do you think? I can tell you. I'm going to give it to you anyway. You've got the right answer. So, but, I can tell you how it feels because I walked into a glass door in GDK Mall day before yesterday. <laughs> Smack! <laughs> I'm not kidding you. That lady at this high design store, I needed a sling bag, also a car. And she said, hello. So I said, hello. <laughs> and you can see the look on her face. Are you okay? Are you okay? I've never done this. I've seen others do it. But I've never done it myself. It's pretty funny. <laughs> Because you're walking through speed and you can't go along. <laughs> Luckily, I didn't go through the door. <laughs> I mean, if my knee hurts, my glasses smashed to my face, and I think this stuff went through. So, not went through. So, I've broken, I used to play volleyball in Ivy Madras, so I've broken four fingers already, so I knew what happened this time. It's called experience, right? <laughs> People with experience, what is experience? Something that's happened before and you learn something from it. So I didn't even go to the doctor. I went to the store, brought this, and put it on, and I'm set. So that's all they'll do. Why go through the x-ray and get the same thing? Now, if it was in the US, it would have cost $400. Here, it cost 140 rupees. All done. So I'm set. That's experience. So early on, we were talking about a couple of things. We'll come back to that. So, 
So this is what I was referring to. This is by this king. And he says, yesterday is history, tomorrow is a mystery. Today is a gift, which is why we call it the present. So what I wanted you to do for the next 45 minutes to an hour is be here as possibly as much as you can. As your mind wanders off, thinking about other things, gently remind it to be here because you came all the way here to listen. And more than listening, I want you to, based on what you've heard, be a little introspective of what it means to you. How does it apply to you? Because I'm just going to have this conversation. I'm not going to tell you step one, two, three. Too many people want, how many of you cook here? How many of you use recipes? Okay, how many of you cook without recipes? Okay, so the number of people who cook without recipes seem to be higher than the people who cook with recipes. Normally, people who use recipes, do their food taste better or the one who does not use recipes? <laughs> what did you learn from that exercise? Experience. So it's more about being aware of how you cook. Not following step one, step two, step three, step four. But how do you live after B school? Step one, step two, step three. So these are things that you want to learn from your other world, your life, and bring it to actual living. So learn from your own life and apply that, not just something that comes out of a book. It was pretty clear about that question, right? There was no confusion in the audience when I asked, who's cooking tastes better, recipe or non recipe, right? Anybody challenge you recipe cooking is taste here? In some instances, yes. But by and large, people who cook without recipes who do the magic, and that sometimes we call it magic. Why? Because no matter what they do, it turns out tasting pretty good. That's the beauty about it. That is a mastery of cooking. So you based on the smell. I knew one cook, a good friend of mine who's no more, who could tell based on the smell how much sugar and salt was in there. That's not me, but I know some people who can smell food and tell you how much sugar. He could smell, he was diabetic, so he could smell and tell you that sugar. That's pretty amazing, great. Some of you are nodding. <laughs> so, I'm going to tell you guys some stories. Two people in the audience already heard about this one, so they can't laugh in advance. So this is a story between a bird and a fish. Each one is trying to describe a book. That's all that's going on. Do you think they'll ever agree? No. Okay. Come on, guys. They, they no. Pick up. No. no. Who's right? Both. Both. Okay. So, this is so obvious in this situation. How come in an argument between two people, only one is right? Right? That's how we argue. Husband and wife, you can start. The kids have turned the bird and the fish to boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife, Sosaba, Ragusaba, whatever. That's how you interact. Because we think only one is right. And usually that's us. But in order to actually fill the boat, you need the perspective of both the bird and the fish and maybe a duck that's floating on the surface of the water as well, because even two perspectives may not be sufficient to build that boat. So I want you to understand it's not either or. We live in an either or society, an either or. Either you're right or I'm right. Remember the story, next time you get into that situation. Both are right, but in a limited way. They have a limited perspective and from that perspective they are right. And every time two people come together, they are going to see it from their vantage <coughs> point. Not both. We may pretend and then if you are really smart, we will say, oh, we know what you are thinking. Right? That's complete garbage. <laughs> Nobody can think to know what the other person is thinking or what they know. So just delete that I and mean, just get back to this idea of the fact that it takes an integration of perspectives and you guys are in B school, so when you get out, it's not going to be black and white. Don't make everything black and white. It doesn't work that way. 
Instead, try to see what the other person is saying. And the first question you ask yourself is, where are they viewing this from? If you ask that, maybe they'll tell you. <coughs> right? Maybe they'll tell you. This is how I'm seeing this situation. And then you may go, oh, because you never even saw that. I mean, this is a very, I, I like to tell very simple stories to make the point. So this is a pretty black and white situation, one another. So the smart person in the room will say, oh, if the fish can jump out into the air and the bird can dive into the water, then maybe they'll have a better view. And yes, that is true. How many birds do you know that go underwater and how many fish do you know that fly out? Some. Very few. But they do exist. So, do not deal with the exception, deal with the majority of situations where you need to integrate the perspectives of both the bird and the fish. And how many of you here want to be entrepreneurs? Okay. The others, what do you want to do? Your track or something else? Because I'm going to talk about both. So, I know some people, their hand is broken, so they don't live here. For any question, the hand is so, this was again the same gentleman who could smell food and tell if it had sugar or salt. He taught me this. Uh, he used to be in public policy at Carnegie Mellon. He happens to be from Hyderabad and uh, a wonderful soul. And he taught me this in a very simple definition. And he talked about an entrepreneur is one who is constantly coping with failure. And a bureaucrat is one who is bent on avoiding failure. I want that to sink in. Yes. Someone who avoids failure, and I think earlier on there was somebody <coughs> they said they bureaucrat want to go by the rule. Right? Why do they go by the rule? Because they don't want to make a mistake. Right? Go by the rule, you can say I did exactly the I followed procedures one through N. And this is what it is. So, an entrepreneur on the other hand, and we'll go to the next one, is someone who's constantly taking chances. How many of you think those two words are completely different meanings? How many of you think those two words are completely different meanings? Okay, so that's a minority in the audience, so let me go and explain. So, courage. Let's go to confidence first. Confidence is typically defined as someone who is reasonably sure of what they are attempting to do, that it will turn out okay. Is that correct? Is that a simple definition of confidence? Yes. What is courage then? Even if I know that I am wrong. Even if the whole world says that I am wrong or even if I have my doubt, still I will try to So you don't know what the outcome might be. You're taking a chance. So you're taking so courage is about being bold enough to take a chance without knowing if the outcome is going to be positive or questionable. Confidence is one where you want to be reasonably sure that if you do this, things will work out in your favor. So <coughs> look at it from a perspective of failure, your attitude towards failure. How do you guys feel about failing? Bad? Good. Good. Who said good? Because I learned from that. Brilliant. So you get the consolation prize. Thank you, sir. So uh, the idea is your attitude towards failure. I think I can't ask you any more questions because I have no more gifts. Uh, your attitude towards failure, failure has always been, you've been conditioned to think failure is bad. Fair? But tell me how many of you learned anything from a success? Because everything worked fine. So when do you learn? So do you want to learn anything or not? So fail more. <laughs> Doesn't mean bad marks or something. I mean, fail, fail, pass, fail. That's not the context I'm using it in, per se. So, obviously, this is not something you take because I said so, but I'd like you to ponder about it. 
if you agree that you learn through failure, right? Because learning versus remembering things out of a textbook is very different. Now with Wikipedia and Google, you don't need anything. You just can get it real time. So recently I was at my son's high school and I talked to the principal and he said, I asked my teachers, what are you teaching in their class that goes beyond Google? Today you can ask any question in Google and we'll get a reasonable set of answers. One of them usually is right. <laughs> Not all of them are right. <laughs> so then you have to have enough awareness to pick a good source. But the chances of you finding a how-to question in Google is pretty high. You don't need to go and do research anymore. In fact, there's a young man, 15 years old, when he was 14, this was on 60 Minutes, you can go search and find it. Uh, when he was 14, his neighbor died of pancreatic cancer. And today at 15, purely by using Google Wiki and Wikipedia, he has now come up with the test for pancreatic cancer. He's 15. So he wrote to 200 laboratories he applied because he needed a little bit of lab space to test his theory. And he had 199 rejects. Finally, a little, uh, uh, right close to where he is, he's in Maryland, uh, Johns Hopkins University, and in fact, was an Indian doctor there, who gave him some space. And today, he's speaking worldwide at cancer uh, conferences, he's speaking at creativity conferences, I think he's already done a TED talk, and he's 15, he's in ninth of fifth grade. So that is the capability that is available to you, but you need to know how to use it. So, just recalling from a textbook is aside. That's all good. So, how do you then go past? So, as an entrepreneur, because this talk is about, I'll, I'll mix it up, given that the audience has 50% who want to be entrepreneurs, I'll mix two. I'm very flexible about what I speak. That's why I told you, it's not like I don't have a clue. I'm interested in what I speak. That's a better way of putting it. Okay. So, I will change and we'll talk about this. I, I, in case you didn't notice, I put very little text on the screen, which means I can make up whatever I want. <laughs> so, as an entrepreneur, the one thing that all entrepreneurs have is a limited amount of time and money. Is that correct? Yes. So, you got to make some tough choices, or you think you got to make some tough choices. But if you want to be an entrepreneur, that is the norm. You're going to be making choices daily. And if you're a human being, you make many more. Or you have the opportunity to make many more. It's just that you don't bother. So, if this is the switch. I'm going, going to go back and forth between my conversation on mindful choices and about making choices. So, both as a person and as an entrepreneur, what you end up doing is making a whole lot of choices every day every moment. The fact that you are sitting here is a choice. The fact that you actually want to listen to me is another choice. The fact that you want to listen to me in the next minute is another choice. Because you could be time traveling right now. What's for dinner? Right? Or what's for what? Right? So every moment you are choosing to do something. And please, I have no patience for the story. They make me do it. Nobody makes you do anything. You choose everything including accepting guilt. So if somebody's throwing a guilt trip on you, mom, dad, uncle, aunt, whoever, professor, <laughs> right? <laughs> Don't blame them. It's you who take the action. So remember that. Always, you are taking your, making the choice. Please don't blame anybody else. No, you don't understand. That you need to come back. Oh, you live in America. It doesn't matter where you live. Eventually, if you drive too fast, nobody else press, press the accelerator for you. You did it. If you got into an accident, maybe somebody else hit you, but still you were part of the accident. There's two different ways of driving. I find the algorithm for driving in India is get out of the way of the other guy. <laughs> Isn't that the algorithm? In the US, you drive your path and everybody follows rules. Here, there are no rules. So there's an algorithm, get out of the way. And if everybody gets out of the way, nobody has an accident. And 
And that's really how, because you want your, the driving skills required in India are much more than any other country. Yes. Because you've got to watch for everybody else's home. <laughs> because you don't want your car to get hurt. So it's a, it's a it's very precautionary mode. So you just slow down. Oh, this is too funny. This was uh, last week, Monday. We went to eat in Hyderabad. We're coming back. Two guys on a motorbike, right in front, went and hit the car in front and fell. <laughs> My niece was driving our car and she stopped. Otherwise, she would have run over both of them. <laughs> These guys were so drunk. I'm laughing. It was stupid, though. They were so drunk that one guy's the car <coughs> out of his hand. He finally got up, picked it up, and my cousin got out of the car because my, uh, his wife told him to go check on them. And he goes and asks him, Trevor, and he says, I'm not to remember exactly, Go oh, Bandi Mardia. <laughs> <laughs> See, they did it. These two guys went and hit the car in front. Go <laughs> Bandi Mardia. That was a great Dalgu Hindi combination, right? So that's what he blamed the car for hitting him. And these guys didn't have to be watched it, but that's how it happens. And both of them were so drunk they couldn't even watch right back to their home. So that's how it happens. And uh, so, this is my, pa my passion is about helping people make better choices. Because if life were a product of our choices, how come nobody teaches you how to make them? I'm not talking about decision making. In these schools, they teach you decision making. Okay? And a new book came out recently called Decisive by Chip and Diane Lee. It's a great book. But even in that book, they say, if your decision takes less than five minutes, this book is not applicable. Okay? So it's a great book for decisions that take longer than five minutes. But now that I've defined choice, how many choices do you encounter on a daily basis that takes less than five minutes? Few or a lot? A lot. So who teaches you how to do those? So your SOL, in case you don't know what SOL stands for, I cannot explain. So again, there's an incredible focus, especially in grade schools. And I mean great, not in a sarcastic way, about success, right? And I've had the privilege of working with, coaching extremely successful people. In fact, the people that resonate most with me, I lovingly have called them the driven and the restless, which means they have a lot of drive. They succeed in practically everything they set foot on, set their sights on. But at the end of it, there's still not, something's missing. So they try again. So when I ask these people, how many of you set your goals and achieved them? Okay, and I'm going to try to How many of you have set goals and achieved them? Everybody should raise your hand because I assume getting into the school was one of your goals. Yes, no? Okay, so raise your hand, guys. Come on, wake up. All of you, unless you guys don't go to the school here. <laughs> So, you set goals and achieve them. What did you feel when you achieved that goal? Happy. 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 How many of you had that even getting into the school? What's next? And guess what? You have two years more to be here. You're stuck here for two years. So let it wait. Okay, you have time. Focus on what's here, not what's next. So what's next is the most common one. Uh, the other one is the short-term euphoria, which is some big feeling of uh, uh, accomplishment and so on, some feeling of uh, pleasure that you did something good. That's the next one. The third one is, uh, is this it. So you thought when you set this goal that you were going to get a lot more of achieving it than you actually got. So is this it? No big deal. The last one is about, I don't know how to put it in text, I always challenge my audience. If you can spell the next thing for me, I'll be grateful. It's called, eh. <laughs> I don't know what it is. So, those are the different types of reactions I typically get to that question. It kind of bunches into those four categories, there are some variations. And last uh, month, yeah, on October 
first I spoke to a group of second year MBA students at Warden on mindful choices for the driven and restless because they're all driven and restless. For sure. <laughs> so, and at the end of it, a few of them, or actually several of them came back, came up to me and said, I wish we had heard you last spring. Before we chose our summer internships, we would have chosen it differently. And the reason is, I later get it, found out, that they focus on only two careers beyond what we consulting and investment management. So if you don't do those two, you're a failure. So your entire focus is on those two options. And they struggle with that, the people who don't want those two. And some just go into those two because that's where they're steered. How many options do you guys have here? Three. Three? Come on guys, you're not hearing me. How many options do you have? Unlimited. Who was that? So unlimited is your options. Who said three? They won't be Okay, that's the point. But maybe I ask the question, how much, how many do they tell you? That could be three. But how many is it for real? Unlimited. Right? You can do anything. You look at me. I did civil engineering, then I did my television and film, then I did computer science, and then I did uh, a little bit of IT services, and then I did wealth management. Why do I and I'm just, now I'm doing something else. So it's easy to choose if you have the courage to choose. Your options are unlimited. Your mind is the only thing limiting your options or conditioning. It's either your mind or it's your conditioning. One of the two is... Uh... So, how do people make their choices? You were supposed to answer this question. Since I don't have the clicker, it's going a little bit ahead. Okay, look guys. <laughs> How do most people think they make their decisions? Logic. Using logic or reason, right? <coughs> so you think. And I'm here today. If there's anything today that I will hope to come to <coughs> is some decisions are made using that. But at most in life are done. Anybody have a clue? What drives your choice making? So the most common one really is fear. And so now in the context of entrepreneur, this comes in when you are running out of money. You think you're running out of money when you even get started because you have a finite amount. So if you make your choice based on greed. Oh, sorry, somebody said greed. So, uh, so fear and greed are probably the two most common drives that make you make your choice. By and large, especially. In different parts of the world, and there's a difference between even South India and North India, if you really look at what motivates. Okay? And since you're a nice mix here, you probably won't see it. But by and large, you'll see what dominates choice making. And most often, it is you're driven by fear. Right? So fear and greed are two emotions or drives that either help you or sometimes hurt you. So one of the things that you've got to realize is in real danger, this is, these are good. Because if there's famine and there's food, eat. <laughs> if there's a tiger chasing you, run. But you don't live in the jungle and there's no famine. And most people here live in a hostel, if not all of you, and you get fed nicely, right? Or at least. <laughs> I live in a hospital too, so I know that. So, the, uh, the whole idea is you want to be aware of what's driving you. If it is fear or if it is grief, the chances are the solution or the, what you arrive at is not going to serve you. Maybe it will serve you in the moment but it's not going to be a sustainable long-term solution. It's a near-term solution. So especially as an entrepreneur, so the first problem comes when your first customer, 
Why do you need a customer? You want revenue, you want cash flow, so you need a customer. So will you accept anybody who walks in the door who is willing to pay? Most likely if you are run by fear. So if your strategy is X, I want to help young mothers accomplish this, and a man shows up with money, you take it. So what happened to your strategy? Now, you say, well, that was okay one time. That's how it begins. And so you become very unfocused because I call it revenue chasing. And you start chasing revenue because of you. Or fear. Right? But most of the time it leads with fear because you say, oh, I'm going to run out of money. But your strategy is what you got to And since you're in Greek school, I'm focusing on strategy. If your strategy is wrong, fix the strategy. But if you start bouncing around, you'll never know if your strategy is right or wrong. Because you just not follow your strategy. So it's very important that you stick to your strategy, listen to the feedback, and make a conscious shift as opposed to just randomly shifting because you need the money. So that's very important. So you start with enough money so that you don't make this mistake. And if you don't have enough money, then have a strong will. Because you've got to stick to your strategy, otherwise, you're not going to know if it is good one or not. So the last one that kind of is probably the biggest culprit is your image. Looking good. That's what makes us make a lot of choices. Looking good. Right? That's the worship. So well, if you're in greed, at least you'll know. This one you don't even know. This is the invisible one. Right? Many, many, many things that you do in life, not even as an entrepreneur, is based on your image. Protecting your image. So that's why I said the person who was introduced by these two kind of people was not me. That's my image. Does that make sense? Yes. And the neat thing is, I know I don't need to protect it anymore or feel it. Because I know it's not me. So I got to be here connecting with you in a meaningful way to make a difference in your life. It has nothing to do with what I've done. So the, my only job right here in that one hour or whatever time you have is to be making a difference. And this is why I told Professor Jojo, are you videotaping this lecture? The reason is, tomorrow some of you are going to act differently. And those faculty members who are not here will think something weird happened. Different? <laughs> <laughs> One of two things, either something wrong with you or something wrong with the guy who spoke last night. <laughs> Again, two options. Right? If you limit yourself to two options, those will be the two options. Something's wrong with you, you woke up, woke up on the wrong side of the bed, or you drank something this morning, or the guy who talked last night brainwashed. It has to be one of these two, typically. But the real thing is I want you guys to remember that I'm here for one and one only reason to make some connection with you so that you look at your life differently starting today. Not just go with whatever was painted or that you were conditioned by somebody else. Can anyone define a robot to me? Raise your hand. Go ahead. Slave. No, what? That's a top man. Slave. Okay. That, that's. What is a slave then? Don't give me one word answer to the definition. <laughs> so, actually, let's get more operative definition. Anybody who has? Yes, go ahead. Uh, so, it's a machine that is programmed and it works according to the program that's set. Perfect. So, how is it different from most of you? <laughs> yeah, because you've been programmed. Conditioned by society, I'm sorry. Wake up. I told you today was not going to be a lecture. Think about it. If you serve expectations blindly, I'm not saying don't serve expectations, so don't give me two options. When I say talk about goals, they'll say, oh, he doesn't believe in goals. That's two options again. Choose your goals carefully is all I'm saying. Don't blindly choose your goals. So most people are conditioned by their parents, 
by their peers and by society. There's no debate. And what you do and choose for yourself is what separates you. Otherwise you're a robot. <coughs> you can disagree with me. That's not a problem. But think about it. If you just go with the flow and believe those are the three options in life, I'm sorry, that's a robot. A, B, C. I can choose between A, B, C. So I have the freedom to choose between A, B, C, but that's it. A smart robot will have more than three choices. So it's not even a smart robot. Okay, so I'm here to challenge thinking. So don't, you can disagree with me as long as you want, but there's some truth to what I'm saying. So think about it. If you choose and li are limited to three choices in life, that means you've been programmed by something outside of yourself. You can choose to do whatever you want to do. Is that fair? Yes. yes. Is that possible? Yes. Whatever you want you can do, it may not be lucrative or it may not be something else. But can you choose to do whatever you want to do? Yes. The consequences are what may limit you from doing certain things but you can choose anything you want to do. And the rest of it is the second stage of reasoning. So, think about it as, if you were in a boat with four people, and you didn't know what the other three were doing, how well could you steer this boat? Now, welcome to your life. So if you are unaware of your fears, if you are unaware of your grief, if you're unaware of how you protect your image, you're in that world. That's okay. So we talk about confusion. So what's, how have you guys been programmed about confusion? Is it good or is it bad? No cheaters. People know the answer. Is it good or bad? Everybody says good or anybody says bad? Bad? Okay. Now let me hear from the person who said bad. Why is it bad? You won't get into trouble, please. <laughs> <laughs> this is not a lecture and I'm not a professor. Anybody who says confusion is bad? No? But usually it is considered bad. Because we don't know what we should do next. If there is a confusion, we can't actually take steps what is actually good for us or what is bad. Okay, so what do you do then? We have to no, no, I have to continue this conversation. So if you don't know what to do next, what will you do? You're in B-School and you're a smart guy. Uh, if there is a confusion, we have to think like, what are the options we have? And choose the best option we have. And choose accordingly. Brilliant. That's what? it. So what did you do? Is it bad? Strategize. No, was it bad? I mean, you have a perfect way out of that hole. Is that a bad thing? You actually learned something, did you realize that? Yes, it is actually good in a way, if I'm not. It's sure. actually good in a way. <laughs> <laughs> Conditioning. Did you see the conditioning? Get unconditioned. He unconditioned himself. I didn't do anything. I just kept asking questions. So what did he say? It's actually good in a way. So it was bad about a minute ago. <laughs> Not even a minute ago, probably. If you can switch your perspective that quickly, imagine the number of things that you are ruining your life with. There are a bunch of them. I can guarantee it because I know them. I'm going to be myself. So I'm not somebody here who's perfect by no means, but at least I know when things go wrong so that you can do something about it. Confusion is good, and I was taught that by somebody, in fact, the assistant dean of the uh, uh, School of Design at Carnegie Mellon. We were designing a program together for children on Egyptology, and he made some comment, and I said, Wouldn't that confuse the kids? And he said, What's wrong with that? And I was in your, sh I had your point of view, saying, you know, it's not going to confuse me. You said, oh, they learn. Bingo. That's all it took. And similarly, what would you think of confusion tomorrow? In a good way. <laughs> he went from kind of good in a way to in a good way. Did you see the change in language? So I had this uh, a couple of weeks ago. Your mind is like a supercomputer, and your self-talk is the program it runs on. Okay? Does that make sense? So whatever you talk <coughs> is what the program it runs on. So if you have three options, it's only three options. If you have four, it's four. It's unlimited, it's unlimited. So I keep giving you guys imagery like this 
simply because I want you. Now, this is one of my, I think, one of my, for myself at least, a very critical insight. So we, many people say, think outside the box. You've heard that, right? Have you ever looked at a box before? <laughs> Have you been in a box? I'm just serious. So think outside the box. So what is the box? Anyone? Thinking is the box. You, your mind created the box, so. And so that is the box. So anybody doesn't know where the box is. That's exactly where it is. So tell me how can you think outside the box? It's a no, you can't, you can't do it. But the, the expectation is don't do things what you typically did. That's the, what they mean by it. But if you really pick on the words, you can never think outside the box because the box was created by your mind. So unless you can really get that perspective and look at the box from the outside, it's very difficult for you to think outside the box when you're inside the box because that's all the world is. So a ball for someone who is inside the ball is very, it will never be called a ball. What would it be? Darkness. Unless it's a transparent ball, in which case it would be something else. But if it was a typical rubber ball or a tennis ball, it would be nothing but darkness if you were inside. But from outside, you say, oh, that's a tennis ball. Without a moment, did you have anything to say, it's a tennis ball, and you look at one. But if you're inside, it won't look like that. So that's how much difference there is based on where you are. So when I turned 50, this is, I had a choice. I could go down the path that most people do and that I was conditioned to and I was programmed to do when I was a robot is make sure you line up everything right and then you can do what you want. Right? Your children, you got to make sure they're settled, whatever the program is. So I have a 15 and a 13 year old, so they're not settled yet. We do, uh, and the meaning of settle in, at least in India, is getting married, right? That <laughs> so that would be bad news if they were settled. Uh, most likely, if, I mean, otherwise, I'd say, you know, you give them an education. So 15 and 13, they don't haven't been to college yet. So I realize if I wait for that magical event, which I call it the if then statement, when this happens, then I'll do that. I thought I'd be. Because 50 is gone by, how many more years? People say second half, that makes an assumption that you're going to live another 50 years. That is not true, it could be tomorrow, it could be tonight. So the point is, you've got to make that choice. So for me, luckily it happened when I turned 50 and I said i got to do it right now. And the interesting piece is, Albert Einstein said, you can, I never read slides because I know you guys can read faster, but the essence of this is, State of the mind that created the problem cannot solve it. It's really the whole notion of thinking outside the box. Right? Because when you're in it, that's all you see. You can never really solve that problem even in that state that you're in. Okay, so we all agree as Albert Einstein was a smart man, right? Actually, he was a very, very smart man beyond. I think he was more a philosopher than a scientist. Uh, he, one of the best quotes that I have enjoyed is actually from a book published by the Vedanta Society on Albert Einstein called The Human Side of Albert Einstein. And that's where the quote in my book comes from, which says, the path to be pursued is poorly lit by a flickering consciousness. That is an amazing set of words because Every word. I think he captured my entire book in one sentence. That's why he's smarter than me. So, as part of the work I do with the Mindful Nation Foundation, which uh, I'll talk about in a minute, is this idea. I work with Ariana Huffington from the Huffington Post. Some of you may have seen the Huffington Post, a very popular blog, one of the largest uh, new blogs I can imagine. So, they created this notion of the third metric. So the typical first two metrics in life by popular demand are money and power. And I think if you're in the government, it would be power and money. Give and take. 
So power and money have been the age old matrix for success. So redefining success beyond money and power. What is that third metric? And the third metric could be anything, depending on the person. For some person, it could be free time. For someone else, it could be good health. Because I know I was talking to Preet before we started, and the focus and the <coughs> I want to get his name right. It's a day, so such a right. Did I get it right? Yes. 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 All right. Okay. So. He was talking, both of us were talking, I mean three of us were talking about the focus on money, right? If you just focus on money, and since we bring an entrepreneurial example, revenue is money, so you focus on money. And if you're starting a company, you have a strategy, right? You have a marketing strategy, or sales strategy, or product strategy, or all kinds of strategies. What is your strategy for your life? I asked him, and Sorry to put you under the bus. He said, Why will come? I said, Why don't you apply that same strategy to your business? It'll come. Don't have any strategy. Just do whatever you want in your business and customers will show up. Technically, if your life you expect happiness and joy and fulfillment to just show up, use the same strategy in your business. Just cuts around and customers will come, profits will show up. Right? Do you think that will work? Yeah. If you're so clear about that that won't work in your business, how come you think it will work in your life? Just because you haven't thought about it. So by not thinking about it, you just are assuming it's going to show up. That's called what? Wishful thinking. It's not going to show up. I mean, some lucky person may get it, but it's going to not be the norm. So if you want joy and fulfillment in your life, have a strategy. I know they don't teach that in school, but if you learn about strategy, you can apply it to anything, correct? So take the strategy building skills that you learn from your B-school and apply it to your own life. Starting tonight. This tomorrow never comes. When you push it to tomorrow, you'll still do exactly what you'll do today. And most seminars, you know what the half-life of a seminar is? About a week. You go back, if at all. Oh, you were not here when I was throwing out of the bus. <laughs> Next slide. So, when it comes to life, what does standard of living okay. measure? What? Quality. Quality. Oh, what does it measure? <laughs> Quantity. Why? It measures the size of your house, how much money you make, it's all quantity. It's not quality. It measures quantity of life. So, yesterday I read something beautiful. We've added years to life, but not life to years. Right? George Collins thinks. We've added years to life, but not life to years. Same thing. Uh, there's a great radio post which. Uh, well, he said, modern medicine has increased the quantity of life, but not the quality. Same thing. So standard of living, we have been able to measure and raise. So one of the challenges I have to you folks who are all bright and be school, so how do you measure quality of life? There's a great uh, talk given by Clayton Christensen from HBS on how do you do and how will you measure your life? as opposed to, because if you don't have a strategy, it's not going to show up, right? And if you truly believe it's going to show up, apply the same strategy to your business. And if you don't, then there's some problem, there's a conflict. So, the clear about quantity versus quality, right? So, one of the things is if you run by fear and doubt, or greed, that's really the fuel. So we're all concerned about cars polluting our environment, I think today or November 5th, I saw a report that there's too many cars in Newtons in Hyderabad only next to Delhi. Because of pollution, diesel, small lung cancer rates so off. We're all concerned about that. But if you're running your life on a day-to-day -day basis, run on fear and greed, an image, you're really polluting yourself from the inside. 
which I think is a whole lot worse because if there's no joy and fulfillment in your life, why do I live? Right? Because that's when you have the robot. You just get on. You heard the phrase rat race. Treadmill. And I have in my blog, a blog post called Upgrading Treadmills. So that's what you do. You make more money, you buy a nicer treadmill and then stay on it. And then you buy one with TV and uh, cell phone maybe. And then another one with some other gadgets. But if you're in the habit of upgrading your treadmill, that a treadmill is just too long. The idea is to be fit without having to spend that kind of time, but it's a metaphor for how we tend to live. Okay. How are we doing on time? Are we doing well? You guys can handle me for a little bit more? Yes. yes. Okay. That's good. So, this is a perfect time to talk about how I came to see life as. So, each one of us lives in six, we inhabit six life spaces. Okay? Yourself, your partner, <coughs> your friends, your work, your money, and your children. Okay, if you don't have children yet, you see with you know, somebody else's children at least. <laughs> and you were a child once, so you know. Big deal, big nieces, nephews, so on. So the life spaces, so you have to, when I talk to certain people, especially the driven and the restless, I talk about work-life balance, right? <coughs> And I say this, you guys all know about balance because balance was there for a long time in the vegetables, right? That's how it's right. So I don't know any balance. You know, if you put everybody here, I guess, when you graduate from B school, will work at least 12 hours a day, right? If not more. So put 12 hours in one side of the balance. And then if you sleep six, do the math. What's left in the other side of the balance? Will this balance ever balance? So drop it. Unless you integrate work into your life, your work-life balance is going to be off. So you cannot separate work from your life. It is a, the largest part of your life is your work. So integrate it. So there's a key word today based on the fish and the bird. It's integrating the perspective. So you want to see how you integrate your work into your life, which means it has to do something for you not just you do something for it. So make sure when you graduate and you go find a position, make sure that that job, whatever it is, or if you're an entrepreneur, even the business that you start, is doing. And one of the questions I'm going to ask you at the end is, why do you want to be an entrepreneur? And if you don't have to answer me, go back and think. Because now that you know what I've shared, ask yourself, why do you want to be an entrepreneur? Okay? Because it'll help you. And what, and what kind of job do you want? Because I know there's 50 so, too many people, tend, especially the people who can afford it, have the opportunity to buy pleasureful experiences. Do you understand what I'm saying? You can go buy pleasure, you can't buy happiness, you can only buy pleasure. So you go to the spa, or you go wherever you want, spend, splurge a lot of money, and then when you leave, it's so, over. So that's all this is supposed to stay, show. And if you're happiness is dependent on the purchase of pleasure, it's going to be like that green light. So when, and when you draw a smooth curve between any points, it usually does not touch all the points, it goes. So there's a crash after a high, right? How many of you have done that? There's usually a crash after a high. So that's what happens. It's not. So there's some people who didn't raise their hand and are smiling. So, any questions on this? It's a roller coaster. I know roller coaster is supposed to be a fun ride, but not in life. In an amusement park, it's fun, but if that's the daily living of your existence, it's pretty painful. You know, a high, high, and a low, low. So, that's the point I wanted to make here is you can buy pleasure, you can buy happiness. So part of the work I'm doing with the Mindful Nation is I was inspired by a congressman, his name is Tim Ryan, who wrote a beautiful book last year called The Mindful Nation, talking basically about how to be more compassionate, how to take care of yourself first, then others, and really build a better country. So I'm right now focused on the U.S. 
but I know a lot of people can copy the US, so usually the bad stuff. So this is one good thing that I hope people will copy from what we're doing at the Mindful Nation. So it's about dealing with stress, dealing with, uh, so the way we have, uh, so he and I have partnered and launched the Mindful Nation Foundation. He inspired me to start it. And uh, I've had the great opportunity of working with some amazing people because of uh, his involvement. And uh, the way we have defined it is a mindful nation is one where there is pupil-centered education, patient-centered healthcare, uh, people-centered policies and politics, and family-centered businesses. Okay? There's power in each of those phrases because we've lost that. Businesses are all about earnings and stock price. They really don't care about anybody else. And that's not a sustainable long-term solution. Just not. And how long, and the brighter you are, you should be able to project and see what's going to happen if you continue to do the same thing over 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. Quarterly stock prices are only 90 days away. If that's all you measure, what are you going to do? You guys are all learned, I'm assuming, what get measured is what you work on. So if you don't measure new metrics, so one of the challenges I would like to challenge you folks in the room is come up with metrics that are beyond traditional KPIs. Because all those people that I talked about, driven and restless, met all their KPIs in a great way. But they found that there was something still missing. Because intangible life KPIs have not been well defined. And just like how we were talking about it, show up, it won't. Because you don't even know what it is. So define it in terms of whether it's free time, whether it's uh, good health, whatever it is for you. Make sure that it, there is a strategy for you to achieve that. And one of the strategies I'd say is be here and be able to listen. Because listening to anyone is the best, best gift you can give them. Because we are in the living in a world where we don't listen to anybody. Right? How many of you text while you talk? And you call it multitasking. Oh, well. So focus on the task at hand. You lose all the switching costs and switching time. You'll do everything right. How many of you have heard this phrase, one size fits all? How well does it fit everybody? <laughs> So how can, I mean, actually some marketing genius came up with that, right? One size fits all. How could that possibly be? Even if it were a hack, look around you and see if all the sizes of your heads are the same. If it's not, it can't. So one size fits all, fits no one properly. And that's basically what happens with multitasking. You do no task properly because you're doing too many at the same time. And that is not a skill. If I see I'm a good multitask in a resume, that goes in the trash can. Absolutely. Because that means they are distracted. Multitasking means they're easily distracted. The next thing comes over there. But then somebody does something else, they are distracted. So paying attention is very key if you want to do things when you do So I know I never talked about the book, but some of you have had a chance. So I try to come up with <coughs> ways to remember complex things. So I came up with these uh, acronyms. The biggest are drive to. Anybody? Somebody knows. Pursue instant gratification, right? And our aim is to avoid painful experiences. And the image is about what? What can you guys read on the screen? So the A is supposed to be, as you scan for these three characters, you're being aware. You're being aware of the, your drive for greed, pleasure and greed, your drive for fear and avoidance, and the chatter. How many of you have voices in your head? I do. So we all do. Some of you are not aware of your, the voices in your head. So, how is it usually positive or negative? Yes, but usually, more often, critical, right? It's 
sign your So, is that you? That's a voice. That's the monkey in your head. So if you're not careful of that monkey in your head, it'll make a monkey out of you. So be careful. And I know people in India know monkeys. Right? So be very aware of that voice in your head. Right? Because the chances are it's going to not serve you well. It's going to criticize you and limit your potential. And the monkey is the one that you can trick as well. But, and again, I'm not here to say kill the monkey. The monkey is your friend too, because your mind is your best friend and your worst enemy. So, use it for, to serve you, don't let it run your life. So, when you have a computer and it has that virus, it's clicking and doing things on its own. That's your mind actually. It's doing things on its own and keeps talking to you. Think of it that's like a virus in your computer, if it's doing that way too much. But your mind is also the computer. So make sure the button keep the virus is clean. If the computer is clean of a virus, it does what you want it to do. If your computer has a virus, it does what it wants to do. And that put a virus is in the computer. So when you give it a task, it's too slow. It's too busy doing other things that it wants to do. So this was a joke I got. Somebody asked me a question today, so I inserted this. Given what I do, people send me these jokes. So, that's all it is. It's just a joke. So, the next one is something I was asked uh, earlier today. Okay, so this is about choices. In one slide was out of sequence. So, choices, this is when I talk about most of the time we are limited to two options, right? That's what we are doing. A and B, left, right, So, you could say work life, and if you look at any options within that line between A and B, I call it the line of compromise. That is the line of compromise. And compromise means what? Each one gave up something. So why it might feel good at that time, over a period of time, each one feels they lost. That's why politics really suffer, because each party agrees to give up something, and then three weeks later, they both this one. Right? And then the whole drama starts all over. So it's a lose-lose. That's what it's called a lose-lose. So again, to get the right choice, you need to kind of look outside that line. So again, thinking outside the line, this is not a box here. So the dark opportunity is one where you go outside that line between my point of view and your point of view and look for alternate solutions that actually can satisfy both true intents of both sides. Okay? That's what this is. And I just call it the third choice, but as you can see, it's just there are many, many more than the third choice. So always try to look for one more than the two obvious ones, at least. One more, and the two obvious ones. So, this is something that I had the good fortune of learning from Bill Gates. And he told me once, this was when, before he was such a big shot, it was probably 91. He said that there are many balls, that you have more balls in your life than you can juggle. The key is to figure out which ones are made of glass. Okay, I want to repeat that. You have more balls that you can, you can handle in life. The key is to figure out which one is made of glass. Because if you drop that, what happens? <laughs> so, I really was impressed with that and took it and embellished it further by adding two more types of balls. A rubber ball and a wooden ball. So what happens to a rubber ball? Once it comes back, you can pick it up and continue. What happens to a wooden ball? Yeah. It means you like bend down and pick it up. So look at the things you have in your life. Don't make everything a glass ball. You'll be too stressed out. How many of you are stressed out? How many of you have a high degree of stress right now? Not today, maybe. You know, in general. No, no confessions here? How many of you are stressed out, guys? 
Okay, good. So how this strategy will help you at least separate and put it in three categories. Rubber ball, don't worry, you can get bouncy. Pick it up later. Uh, and rubber ball is not somebody you care. Because they'll bounce back doesn't mean you put them as a rubber ball or they'll not <laughs> That's not a rubber ball. So that, oops, I one, one, one option removed. Okay. So a wooden ball is something, if you drop that, you'll have to do some extra work between pen down and pick it up. Glass is the only one that shatters, mess, you have to clean it up, a lot of work. So make sure you take care of the glass balls. So it's a form of prioritization. You heard that word, right? How do you prioritize? This is another visual metaphor to use. Is this made of glass? Just by asking that question, you go, not really. Then don't make it such a big deal. So can you can categorize it that way. Because most often, just saying how important is it is not good enough. Because everything becomes kind of important. And then you have a whole bunch of priority one task that you don't have time to do. So, this is what I was going to There's nothing more on that slide. So, this is a movie that came out probably in the 70s or 80s. It's uh, one of the most powerful movies that I had seen, where the actress, Meryl Streep, is in a concentration camp, and when she's allowed to leave, she has two kids with her, and she was asked to choose only one. She can take only one. The other one left behind. So she had to make a choice between her son and her daughter, and she had to choose only one kid. It's one of the toughest movies I've seen. But the reason I talk about this movie is most of you don't have so few choices. Right? Your choice is a lot simpler than this one. If she could make that, but she had to, I think anything is possible. So don't make all your choices life and death because they are not. How many choices did you think were life and death that you didn't make properly? Many. Right? Many people, how many of you have made a choice that you thought was life and death and it actually went wrong? Okay? But you're alive, right? Yes. Which means it couldn't have been life and death. Because otherwise you won't be raising your hand, you won't be here. Okay? So that's the point I'm trying to make is, that's again the mind, exaggerating the importance of that issue and making a mountain of a mountain of So this was a question that came back uh, to the before the talk during the interrogation as I friendly <coughs> So the question was, after a success, people tend to have setbacks. How do you handle them? Is that the question? Yes, sir. So I had asked my daughter to do this drawing, and if you guys can read the little thing that showed up, I made it the background of my iPad and I have an app called the Now. I'll have to read it, I guess. Uh, could you read it for me? Because I can't read this for <coughs> Okay. Everybody awake? <laughs> okay, you know what? I'm going to read it from here. So, The now, to live only for some future goal is shallow. It's the sides of the mountain that sustain life, not the top. Perfect, thank you very much. So what it is, is we tend to reach the first peak in our life. We struggle, we do all the work that's required and we reach the first peak, which is our first goal. What happens then? What's next? Right? What's next? So comes the next peak and then you have this imaginary red line that you draw to the next peak and you want to go from this peak to that peak. But because you don't have the visual in front of you, you take to say, okay, I got this done, I need to do that. And that, that the only way it can happen in real life is if you have that red line going directly from peak one to peak two, which means it's a zip line that defies gravity. <laughs> Did anyone know how that works? No. I don't. So the chances of you getting there is pretty low in that path. So when you start heading towards your next goal, you're going to go down the side of that slope. And what happens to you? Now you're upset. Because 
because you're not getting any closer to your next goal. You're actually getting further away. And by the time you reach the bottom of that valley, you're so upset that you're furthest away from your new goal, that you're just too consumed in working harder and more towards achieving your goal, that you miss, where do you think rivers are, on peaks or in valleys? Valleys. 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 What else? So what does the river do? Starts life, right? All the old civilizations were started on banks of rivers because you need water. <coughs> So my daughter drew those flowers because that's where the flowers grow, right? You need, you need water. And we are so upset when we are there, we miss the whole journey of life. And then you start climbing again and you see the flag and we are all happy again. Or so we think. Again, the mind is happy but you probably are not. So this is a visual, again, for you to look at handling setbacks. Setback, I call this the valley of learning because that's where you learn. And we call it, I play on words quite a bit, the value of learning is actually the value of learning. Because when you actually go down, that's why confusion is? Good, love me. Thank you. I think it went back. So how does one change? Any ideas? What is the first thing you need to change if you want to change? Accept the things. Oh, that's beautiful. Somebody said acceptance. Awareness. Awareness, acceptance. Acceptance is a brilliant thing. All acceptance means is if something has happened, it's already happened. That's all. It doesn't mean get walked over or be a doormat. So the real thing is changing your life. Perceptions or mindset. Beliefs. Right? It starts with your belief. One more. Yeah. And then, once you can look, challenge your beliefs, which is what we challenge one belief about confusion, which that's the point. So, another belief would be, I'm not a robot or I am a robot, whichever it is. Then the second one is the words you speak. And the third is what? Actions. Beautiful. <laughs> okay. So, Henry Ford, how many of you know Henry Ford? Now don't go, okay, good. <laughs> well, Street didn't win, but Henry Ford didn't. So, that's one of the, my favorite quotes of all time, which is, whatever you think is right, is right. Which is a phrasing of that. Uh, caricature or drawing, which is so apt. So, there's a dog and you going for a walk, <coughs> and see what the dog sees and what you see. Okay. <laughs> But because we think it is pure, sacred, we still respect it. Now, at Gangotri, how is it? Is it pretty pure? Yes. Now, so, what happened along the way? People put stuff in it. Right? Basically, that's what happened. People are due for whatever. It's a human accomplishment. But put stuff in it. And so, what if you think of Gangotri as your mind. It starts off pure and then you get conditioned. So depending what you allow consciously or unconsciously into your mind, you end up being the Ganga and Alhava. Then you need what I call downstream treatment plants. Right? You need water treatment plants if you want to bring water out of the Ganga if it's further down. And for humans, what are what treatment plants called? Psychologists, psychiatrists, Meditation. all these people who come to help you out because your mind got altered in a similar way. So think about it in this metaphor about the purity and how what you allow. So I have only one recommendation. If your mind is cluttered, there are many, many, many ways to declutter it. Find any one that works for you. Okay, any one, meditation of any kind, yoga, whatever else, something that gives you a break so that you can just take care of your mind. Because most people don't take care of their minds, few take care of their bodies, but we want major results. How many of you have been on a plane? All of you have so. So there's, uh, okay, if you're not, 
There's an oxygen mass made of water in a plane. Let's say when the pressure, cabin pressure drops, you should know this by heart, the oxygen mass will fall from the top and then you put it on the person next to you before you're putting it on yourself. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it's funny. I was just on a flight from uh, Chicago to Pittsburgh recently. Oh, actually, no, the one I came here from Pittsburgh to Washington, D.C. And there was an entire basketball team or football team. And they, all of them, mimicked their air hostess to those, to those white people. <laughs> she couldn't even continue. She was just laughing because they were so good. And she came and said, you know, that's really what you're supposed to follow along. But they were all perfectly in sync. About 25 of them doing exactly what she was doing. <laughs> Thank you very much.